So I came on the police department in July 1983. That's when I was sworn in. People ask all the time if I always wanted to be a cop, if it's something that I aspired to do as a kid. And the honest answer to that is no. I didn't always want to be a cop. The truth is I didn't know for the most part what I wanted to do when I was young. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn, Canarsie, Brooklyn, uh, which is kind of a wild neighborhood at the time when I was young, a uh, middle-class neighborhood. Um, I had some wild friends, and we did a bunch of wild things. And, you know, uh, my neighborhood had a lot of mob guys in it, a lot of cops, firemen, uh, guys in the trades. And, you know, when you grow up in that kind of environment, you could go in all kinds of, you could, you know, veer in all different directions um, as you grow up. When I was young, like I said, my friends, we were pretty wild. On the weekends, like when we were 16, 17, 18 years old, we'd all get together and we'd go to the city. The city meaning Manhattan. Guys from Brooklyn and, and the other boroughs called Manhattan the city, especially back in the 70s and 80s. That's how we refer to it. And when you're 16, 17 years old and you're bored and you're looking looking for excitement, most of the time you find trouble. And that's as, as a, those, a young kid with, you know, wild friends, tough friends, we'd go down to uh, where the trouble was. We'd specifically look for trouble. We'd go down to 8th Avenue and 42nd Street and Broadway, and, and there was nothing but high crime, prostitutes, um, pimps, drug deals in every every hallway and every uh, doorway, um, the peep shows. It was, a, it was a really a crazy time. Uh, many times we got shot out, shot at by the pimps simply because we were, they knew we were up to no good, looking for trouble and, you know, just uh, we had no real right being in such a perverted and such a dirty and gritty neighborhood, to be honest. But growing up in that environment or coming to Manhattan and seeing that stuff and then going back to Brooklyn, you know, you pick up things and you learn things and you see things as you get older or when you're older that most most people, most legitimate people don't realize they've never seen. And um, it's having that experience that helps a guy be a good cop or a female be a good cop. And like I said, I grew up with guys and there was a lot of mobsters in my neighborhood and we had a lot of dealings with wise guys, with Italian mob guys. And two in particular led me to stay out of that life, not go into it. Um, actually it turned me, it veered me and turned me away from that life. And I'll just go into them real quick. I'll tell you. Uh, um, so one of them was I was doing, I had, a friend of mine asked me to get involved with this burglary for a guy named Eddie Lino. Eddie Lino was John Gotti's, at the time, right-hand man. He was a known guy in my neighborhood. He was a drug dealer. He was a, known to be a killer. And he was a really bad guy. And he had made some kind of friend. He had some kind of relationship with one of my friends. And he asked my friend to do this burglary for him. And uh, it was a, a shuttered bar and to take out these machines and these joker poker and these cigarette machines and get it to him. And we did it. And when, the time got, when it was time to get paid from this guy, Eddie Lino, um, he wasn't looking to pay us. He was almost looking to stiff us. And, and, you know, he was looking to keep the money for himself and not pay us what he had said, what, what he had agreed to. And when I made a little bit of a commotion out of the fact that I wanted to get paid, um, he begrudgingly did pay me. But the truth of the matter was I thought he was going to shoot me in the head after he gave me the money. And I saw the treachery and the deceit that a guy like him even though he was a high-ranking guy in the, in the Gambino crime family, even though he was Gotti's right-hand man, um, he was still ready to shoot a 17-year-old in the head for just a couple hundred bucks. So that actually turned me off to that, well, was the beginning of getting turned off to that lifestyle. Two of the guys that I actually did that job with, a couple of years later, one of them had, was the, their head was decapitated, was found on a beach in Brooklyn, Plum Beach, and the other one, uh, again, a few years later, he got a job working at a, an armored, armored car service. And apparently he didn't like working there, and he figured he could rip it off. So he got some guys together, they ripped off the armored car, 
they got caught, and he flipped on all his friends. So again, the, the treachery, uh, the self-perseverance, it, it just, it's ever, you know, it doesn't stop in that life. So that's one thing, that's one incident that turned me off. The other incident that turned me off was, again, as a kid, 17-year-old, we were hanging out in Brooklyn, and uh, we got, my friends and I got involved with a guy named Bruno Facciolo, who was a well-known uh, Lucchese mobster. In fact, he's the character that, in the movie Goodfellas, he's the character that takes uh, Joe Pesci to his death when they kill him. So that was this guy. Of course, this was way before the movie. But um, he was a known guy in my neighborhood, and we get in a dispute with him. And at the time, I actually left, right before the assault. My friends actually end up beating this guy Bruno up. And um, the bottom line is, Bruno found out everybody that was involved who beat him up. And he took revenge on everybody. I wasn't involved. I had walked away at the time, and I was already home by the time my friends beat him up. But he found out everybody that was involved with beating him up. And the only way he found that out is by one of my friends giving up all my other friends. So again, I, you, you know, you get to see the recurring theme of uh, self-preservance and uh, riding on your friends. And so those two incidents, among others, were two of the things that kept me from going into that life. Um, I still didn't know what I wanted to do in life, um, but I at some point take the police test and I become, I guess, sworn in, like I said, July of 1983. Um, I originally get sworn in with the New York City Housing Cops, which is, at the time, there were three, de three departments. There was the New York City Housing Police, which policed mostly the projects. There were the transit cops that did the subways and the regular city cops that patrolled uh, the streets. My first assignment was in Coney Island, and I was only 21 years old, straight out of the academy, I was with my field training officer, two other cops, and my field training officer was an older guy, a well-respected cop, and he knew the streets. And he was an active, even though he was up there in age, he was still an active cop. My first arrest, uh, it was kind of a funny story. Well, uh, it's a little unusual. We're walking up to a building on 23rd Street between Mermaid and Surf Avenue. The name of the project was called Carrie Garnets. And it was one of the busiest and most dangerous projects in, in Brooklyn, maybe in the whole city. And uh, as we walk up to this particular building, there's a bunch of guys hanging out in front of the building. And they're drinking and they're talking loud and they're just hanging around in their early 20s. Um, some could have even been as young as 18, 19. But there were about four or five of them. When they see me, my FTO Sal and the two other cops approach the front of the building they all disperse, except for one in particular guy. As we walk up to the building, my FTO turns to me and he says, Mike, lock this guy up. And I followed suit. I did what my FTO, my field training officer, the experienced cop, I did what he told me. I put the guy against the wall. I took my handcuffs out. The guy didn't give me a problem. Put his hands behind his back. He knew the routine. He'd been through it. Put his hands behind his back. I locked him up. Now, to be honest, I, I felt a little bit um, actually like sick to my stomach. I didn't know what this guy did. I didn't see him do anything overtly criminal. And it was a little bit upsetting to me. I put the guy in the cop car. Me and my uh, training officer go back to the command, back to the precinct. And I grab him on the side and I ask him, Sal, what, what, did, what did this guy do that I locked him up? I wasn't confrontational. I just had to know what, I, what this guy did that would lead me or lead Sal to make me lock this guy up. And what Sal said, you know, stuck with me. And again, this is an older guy who had been through the mill. He's a good cop. He said, Mike, these guys, they've seen me, meaning him, Sal, go to the front of that building and move them a half a dozen times. When they see me or any cop, they know they have to move. They're not allowed to be in front of the building. They're not allowed to be drinking. They're not allowed to be smoking pot. They got to move. Everyone dispersed except this one guy. What he was doing was he was testing me, meaning Sal. He was testing the other rookies, and he's testing any other cop that wants him to move. He knows he's not supposed to be there. He's got to go to jail. He's got to get a summons. Basically, it was a disorderly conduct summons. Um, we, we bring him to the station house, and that's what we were going to do, write him up. 
Well, when we brought him back to the station house, we called the warrant squad. Uh, it was protocol to do that. And he had a bunch of warrants wanted. He was a wanted guy, on, wanted about four or five warrants for robbery, for a heavy assault, for a weapon. I mean, he was a bad dude. And Sal was right. He knew he wasn't supposed to be in front of that building. He was really testing the cops. And he basically, uh, not only was testing us, he was trying to show that he was a tough guy. And what Sal also said was these guys in front of the building, they're actually keeping the people in this project, the good people, hostage. The older people are afraid of them. They didn't want to go outside. The young women with their babies and with their families were afraid of these guys were going to harass them. And they keep these people in the project, in this particular building. They basically keep them hostage. And he was right. And that was my first arrest, was locking this guy up. Again, in the beginning, I wasn't happy with it. But once the warrants popped, I realized Sal was right. This guy's a bad dude. He, he deserves to go back to jail, which, which he did. He went back to jail. Um, after a couple of months in Coney Island, I kind of got bored, and I wanted to go to where there was a lot, a lot more action. And I ended up transferring to Alphabet City, Lower Manhattan, Lower East Side. And the reason I wanted to go there was when I was, in the, when I was actually going to the police academy, every once in a while my friend's father would drive me and him, who was in my class, to the academy. And very often he would drive, take the streets to the academy, which was on 20th Street and 3rd Avenue. And he would get off on Housen Street, and he would take, which is the Lower East Side, and he'd take the side streets. And when we'd pass these projects on the Lower East Side, you would see lines of people lined up as if they were at a, at a cheese line or, or at a food store. And there's 20 people, 25 people in a, in a line. And then you see people nodding out, uh, you know, like heroin nodding out on the side. Um, people laid out on the street. It was really, a, uh, it, was, it was horrendous and it was disturbing. And I remember asking my friend's father, who was a, a SWAT team cop, uh, well-respected cop, again, another guy that knew the streets. And I asked him, what's going on with these lines and these people? And he told me, they're online buying heroin. And I, even though as a kid I went to Manhattan and, and 42nd Street and I saw drug deals and I saw, you know, things that were uh, disturbing, this was particularly bad, uh, seeing people line up like this. And I asked him, how come, how, why is this happening? Why is there nobody taking, taking action against these people, these drug dealers, these people copping dope? And basically... He, he being on a job as long as he had been, he said the city knows about this particular area, which was called Alphabet City. He said the city knows about this, but it's contained. And the drugs are here, and it's, it's not, I mean, there's drugs all over the city, he said, but this is basically where drug addicts come to get high, and it's a contained situation, and, and the city lets it go on. Well, um, that stuck in my head. And after I worked in Coney Island for a short time, just a few months, I put into transfer to Alphabet City, and that's what I did. I was transferred to Lower East Side, uh, the projects, Alphabet City, which are walled houses, Reese houses, Baruch houses, uh, pit, pit houses, and some others. And I hook up partnering with a guy named Jeff who grew up in Brooklyn like me, was just a year or so older than me, and we not only became friends, we, we, had, we thought a lot alike, and... One of the early times when we were working together, everything, let me just backtrack. Every, all, all the crimes on the Lower East Side and Alphabet City, a very high percentage of them go back to heroin and the heroin trade. Uh, whether it's a robbery, they're sticking people up for money to buy dope, or it's an assault, they get in a fight over drugs or heroin. Most of the crimes revolved around heroin, the heroin trade. So early on, me and my partner would. We're working, we were driving in the car. And just to give you an example how brutal, brutal things could be down there, uh, these two guys are walking uh, down, Avenue, down 5th Street or 6th Street and Avenue D, and a guy comes up behind them with a bat and hits the one guy so hard on the, in the back of the head that the victim's eye pops out of his head. And, um, of course, it was a gruesome scene. The eyeballs on the floor, 
The guy is down. The guy with the bat then turns and hits the second guy. And my partner and I grab him and, of, of course, arrest him, call for emergency you know, EMS. And it all boiled down to drugs. This guy, these guys got high with this guy's girlfriend uh, the night before, and they were screwing around with this guy's girlfriend. Uh, all, all because they all got high with the dope from Avenue D. And that's just the way it was down there. There were shootings and uh, homicides, all because of the dope. Well, when I got down there, I originally went down there to make arrests, and, and I found it exciting, and, and I enjoyed the, uh, the chase, so to speak. But little by little, I started to realize that a lot of the people in the projects were good people. And when you start watching little kids uh, play with hypodermic needles and try to stab each other, or coming down the, the, in the morning, going to school, and they have to step over a guy in their lobby who shot, shot up uh, in the lobby and defecated on himself and still has a needle in their arm. And um, it, it was, you know, you start to realize that these people really needed somebody to try to help that area, that area and that neighborhood. And my partner and I took it amongst ourselves or upon ourselves to really get involved, and we did. And we actually did things that we weren't supposed to do. Um, you know, a lot of these laws are written and, and they kind of uh, restrain the cops in a lot of ways. Uh, but we were working down there first in uniform and we made so many arrests that they put us in a special unit. And the unit was called Operation 8. And that unit was a plainclothes unit that um, specialized in the eight worst projects in Alphabet City. And it was mostly a drug unit and a gun unit. And that's what we were focused on. So my partner and I, two other cops and a sergeant, uh, we had a vehicle that was, uh, that was sponsored, so to speak, from the federal government, radio, uh, some training, and... Like I said, the name of the unit was Operation 8. Now, we had the know-how to lock up a lot of these guys, but it was hard for us to get to the top echelon. We'd lock up the street dealer. Uh, we'd lock up the buyers. But it wasn't easy to get to the main guys. But eventually what we did was we started to break protocol, I guess you could say, or, or, or patrol guides, guidelines. And... We needed to know who was behind the scenes. And what we do is we let people open up or sell drugs on a particular day if they give us information on who was supplying, on who was coming in with drugs. And it worked. Guys, like I learned earlier as a kid, guys ran on their friends. They ran on anybody just to get ahead for self-perseverance. And that's what they did. They would, we'd either pay them out of our own pocket um, with cash or we'd pay them with if we find drugs on somebody, we give it to these guys, and that would be their payment for telling us what was going on and to allow us to make the bigger arrest. Was it right? You know, in my vision, uh, at the time especially, in my estimation, it was. Did the ends justify the means? I always feel that what we did uh, led to the bigger fish and always uh, helped get the bigger guy, and that's what we were looking to do, get, get the main guys. Uh, we had informants. Uh, most of the time, we, like I said, we took care of them. But again, it's always a risk. And we we lost informants. Some of, One or two of our informants had gotten killed, either talking to us or maybe they were talking to other cops. But again, the main guys, the top guys, were vicious, vicious guys. And in fact, at some point, they we were doing such a number on them and putting such a hurt on their business that they put a $50,000 contract on my partner and I. And the way we found out was there was a, uh, a robbery pattern of banks, a bank robbery pattern uptown. And the FBI had an informant. And when he was telling them about the bank robbery uh, or information regarding the bank robbery, he mentioned that there was a contract on my partner and I down in Alphabet City. So this contract was confirmed they temporarily transferred my partner and I to Harlem just to stay out of, out of the view of these guys. Um, but that really wasn't going to help because we weren't even there one day and we saw some of the Lower East Side dealers up in Harlem and they knew where we were. So they were all over. Um, they were making so much money. They were driving brand new Mercedes Benzes, Jaguars, a Maserati. And that's 
before you could lease a car. So these guys were paying cash for these cars, and they were young kids. I was a young guy. I was in my, like I said, early 20s, 22, 23, 24, and they were just as young as I was, and they were making all this crazy money. Um, uh, at some point, the DEA, who we had helped, every once in a while they'd be looking for a particular drug guy, and they'd ask us if we knew him, and of course, if they were from Alphabet City, we knew everybody. We'd pick them up for the DEA. Um, at some point, one of the groups in the DEA, Group 34, got involved with a case, and they made an arrest, but the U.S. attorney declined prosecution on a couple of these drug dealers. They came to, they found out that my partner and I knew everybody, they came to us, we knew right away who these guys were. They asked our chief if we could go be assigned to the DEA, and we were. We were, we were assigned specifically to the Drug Enforcement New York, Group 34. And after an eight month investigation, we were able to arrest 40 of the Alphabet City drug dealers. We took down all the main people. Um, and basically we changed Alphabet City from what it was to a, a nice neighborhood. In fact, they even changed, real estate even changed it from Alphabet City or from the Lower East Side, they started calling it the East Village. Uh, people came in, they bought real estate. The whole neighborhood's completely changed, even to this day. I mean, there's still some drugs there, but nothing like it was. You don't see kids kicking hypodermic needles in the street, um, none, none, of, none of that. So um, I was really proud of myself, my partner, the DEA guys, Operation 8. We did what we uh, intended to do. Of course, like I said, my partner and I risked our jobs doing some of the things we weren't supposed to do. However, I felt that it was uh, it paid off in the end. Eventually, a couple of years later, I get assigned to, I leave the DEA, and I get assigned to the New York City's Missing Persons uh, Division. Now, that squad or that, that um, unit isn't an active unit. It's not an enforcement unit. People think when you, especially there's some TV shows with missing persons on, it's not like an exciting unit. And that's what I did. I like going out. I like locking people up. Um, and this was completely out of, out of my character, out of my nature to deal with this. It's mostly a clerical unit. There's probably about 13,000 to 15,000 people that are reported missing in New York City every year. For the most part, those people come back. They're not really missing. They're just people that wander off and then they come back or they're runaways. Uh, in fact, most of them are runaways and then they get found or then they come back. But occasionally there are legitimate missing people who leave and no one knows what happens to them. But again, those cases are far and few in between. In any event, while I was there, I was trying to pick up some old cases and see if I could get something exciting going, work some cases that would, you know, uh, keep me motivated. And I found one or two, there was a case on the Lower East Side, a guy named Vernon Jones, who was with uh, three of his friends. And it was New Year's Eve and he was in his house and in his apartment and he got sick and uh, threw up and his friends went across the street to buy some uh, napkins to clean up. And in the process between going across the street and coming back to the apartment, which took tops two minutes, he disappeared and he was never to be seen again. And I tried to reactivate that case and I did reactivate it, but I came up negative with, with anything, anything substantial. No, nothing came up. In the process of fooling around with that case or investigating that case, uh, I get a call from an inmate in Attica. The guy's name was, well, he introduced himself over the phone as Tiny. That was his nickname. Uh, his real name was John Lentini. Now, John Lentini was a 350-pound biker, um, and he had been arrested, actually. He was in jail in Attica for sodomizing his two, two little children, and one was an infant. And uh, he was a, a demented pedophile, obviously. And they arrested his wife, too, at the time, but his wife ended up flipping on him and saying she was forced into sodomizing the, the children with him, and he goes to jail. Well, this happened in the, he got arrested in the early 80s. By the time he calls me, it's the mid-90s. 
That's when I was in this missing person squad. <clears throat> and he calls me and he says he has information on a missing kid. Uh, and he butchers the name, but he means the kid's name he means is Eton Pates. And Eton Pates is a infamous case here in New York City where this young boy disappeared in the late 70s. He was going to school on his own for the first time. His mother was looking out the window. She turned around for, according to all reports and her statement, for less than a minute. When she looked back, the kid was gone. Eton Pates was gone. And that happened down in uh, the Soho area of Manhattan. So this guy, Tiny, this biker, vice president of this motorcycle gang, he says he has information on that particular missing person kid. Now, again, that was a well-known case. So I made arrangements and I went up to see Tiny in Attica. When I got there with the detective to interview him, the correction officer was a little ambivalent about letting me go in there and talk to this guy alone because he had a violent past. But again, it didn't matter. I had to go see him. We went in. We sat down with this guy, Tiny. So Tiny tells us this story, and it's kind of an intricate story, how, about how he and his biker gang used to do security for these rich elites in Westchester and Yonkers. And security meaning he would secure their homes, their houses, while they were having satanic rituals and sex parties and drug parties in these mansions. And he would, what he would do is he would get his biker gang called the Rat Pack, and they fell under one of these major gangs. I don't know if it was the, I don't remember if it was the Hells Angels or the Mongols or whoever they were associated with. But they would wear their colors and they'd go up to Westchester and Yonkers and they secure the perimeter of these mansions. And in the mansions were supposed to be these satanic ritual parties. And again, according to him, they were using drugs and having crazy sex orgies and all that stuff. And at some point he becomes so known to these rich elites that they invite him into the mansions. And basically he started to have, having the run run of the of the places and he'd go in and out at his own leisure while his the rest of his security the rest of his biker guys would hang outside and again they were making sure nobody came in they were making sure no cops came in that was their that was their their job so he tells me that in when i'm up there in attica speaking to him he tells me that at some point at one of these parties uh they have an altar built uh, in this house, and there's people on, on this uh, s stage, so to speak, and they call out this little boy, and they call out the kid. He, they, uh, he Again, he kind of butchers the name a little bit, but what he says is they call out Eton Pates, and they bring him onto this stage, and they give him some kind of satanic blessing. They do something with, with a rope, they measure him or something to that effect with this rope. Then at some point they lay him on this uh, altar that they built. And he says at that point he takes himself away from the scene. And he doesn't see what actually happens, but he later learns, according to him, that they sacrificed the little kid to Satan. And they kill him on, the, on, the, on this altar. Now... Again, I don't know how true this is. This is coming from Tiny. Um, he had a, you know, firsthand experience according to him, but he said he left at the, at the time. But everything else he said, he witnessed. He personally witnessed. Him and, and, and another, him and the president of the bike gang, he was the vice president. And at the president of the bike gang has since uh, passed away. So I needed to verify. First of all, um, Tiny was... Like I said, he was a pedophile. He was, uh, I'm sure he was a, uh, a liar. He was looking to get out of jail. He was up for parole. He was looking to get parole. This was, this was how he wanted to get parole, by helping us. Uh, again, he had a history. You know, he wasn't a good guy. He was a criminal. But what he said and the way he said it and some of the things that he told us wasn't so outstanding or so unbelievable that we couldn't follow up on it. And we did. And we asked him to verify certain names. And a lot of the people he gave us were people that were dead. And we couldn't verify because I needed other witnesses to this particular incident. 
what he told us was this particular cult was the same cult that David Berkowitz was involved with. Now, David Berkowitz, for those people that don't know, was a serial killer here in New York City. And he killed like six people and, and shot like seven or eight others. And he was a serial killer from 1976, the summer of 76, till the summer of 77 when he got arrested. And he would kill, uh, kill and shoot very often at people in Lover's Lanes, guys and girls making out in the Lover's Lane. He also uh, shot some, some, some girls that were alone. Um, but he, it was a, 1976 when he was out there, he put all of New York in a, in a state of panic. Girls with dark hair were bleaching their hair blonde because supposedly he only shot women with dark hair. Um, they were with long hair, they would put their hair up in a bun. And it was a very well-known case. It was um, as high profile, let's say, as the Zodiac Killer, but the New York version of the Zodiac Killer. Son of Sam. The Son of Sam was, yeah. His name was David Berkowitz. And he would leave notes for the police to find. And then he became corresponding with uh, a, a, the writer at the Daily News, uh, Jimmy Breslin. And he would taunt the police. Anyway, this cult that Tiny was involved with is supposed to be the cult that Berkowitz, because Berkowitz, originally when he gets caught, he says his neighbor's dog told him to do these killings. And he basically was trying to plead that he was mentally incompetent. Years later, he said he was, there was no dog involved. He said he, he Berkowitz, was involved with this occult, and the cult met up in Westchester and Yonkers, and that's later what Berkowitz said. Well, that's the cult that this guy, Tiny, said was involved with this homicide, this kid homicide. And Tiny gave us a lot of stuff that was, we were able to verify. Uh, he gave us another killing that we were able to verify. And at some point, he gives us another Son of Sam-like killing. Two people in a lover's lane in Cypress Hills in Brooklyn. It was never viewed by the police as a Son of Sam-type killing because the victims were black. But Tiny actually gave us the shooter. Uh, we went and he interviewed him, and we actually got a confession from him. Now, again, Berkowitz said that he was part of a cult. He said that he wasn't the only shooter. Other people did these, these uh, serial, mer serial uh, crimes and shootings and homicides. And now here's Tiny giving us a story that's kind of matching Berkowitz. Anyway, Tiny gives us information that we're able to verify and looks like we're gonna be able, now we wanna go see Berkowitz. At some point, we had a lot of information and just to backtrack a little, Eton Pates' body had never been found at this point. Years later, very recently, somebody confessed to killing Eton Pates, but the person that confessed to killing Eton Pates, Pates had a mental history of uh, being mentally incompetent. So nobody knows if he really did it. He went to trial, it was a hung jury the first time, and then eventually they convicted him. But nobody really knows if that guy, who had nothing to do with this, was the killer of Eton Pates. We were still investigating Tiny's allegations that were seeming to come, come tr become true with all the uh, investigations we were doing. Well, at some point we make arrangements to go see David Berkowitz and ask him, uh, not only about Eton, about his shootings and about this cult and this whole, this whole, this whole scene. And the NYPD supervisors wouldn't let us go see Berkowitz. Uh, we continued the investigation. There were other people for us to interview. At some point, they finally tell us, stop the investigation. We don't want, just cut it out. Don't, don't investigate this anymore. Without their knowledge, I tried to go see Berkowitz again. I've since had correspondence with him, although he won't say anything about these. He doesn't talk to me about the homicides, uh, but the NYPD cut, cut us down again, and they wouldn't let me go see Berkowitz. So that's another case that uh, we didn't get to the bottom of. It's an interesting case. Uh, I would have liked to have seen what happened. And again, like I said, even though Tiny, Tiny was in jail, he was a known pedophile, he was obviously a bad guy. He wanted to get out of, he wanted to get paroled and he was giving us information. Uh, and a lot of the information uh, was verified. 
some of the people he said was involved. We interviewed, and again, like I said, one guy admitted to these shootings, and they wouldn't, NYPD wouldn't let us follow up on that either. So that was a, a very strange case. People ask me all the time, why didn't you think they would let you follow up and go further with this? Uh, I think because per, my personal opinion is Berkowitz was arrested, the case appears to be closed, a lot of people got promoted. Um, I don't think anybody really wants to find out that there were more people out there that were involved with this homicide, with these Berkowitz, with these Son of Sam uh, homicides. And I think really that's why they kept us off that case. So uh, that was an interesting case. Another case I worked in that same squad, in the Mystic Person squad, was a case on this guy, Andre Rand. Andre Rand was a, he had worked in a place called Willowbrook. For those people that don't know Willowbrook, Willowbrook was the largest uh, mental state facility in the United States at the time. So they had people with all kinds of mental problems there. Uh, Down syndrome, um, any kind of mental incapacity, people were put there. It was only built for 2,000 people at the time. This is going back to like the 60s. And they had over 6,000 people there. And the, the staff, it was discovered, was severely mistreating this, the, the residents in this place. Geraldo Rivera did this big uh, expose on it back in like 1977 or 78. And he went in somehow with a camera and he filmed these, these residents who were really victims. And he, see, had them, uh, he filmed them in their own depth. Uh, defecation and and uh, urine uh, with no clothes on. It was it was really a a, a terrible scene. And this guy Andre Rand worked there. He initially worked there as a some kind of maintenance guy, and then eventually he gets to become some kind of physical therapist without any training, or just somehow he becomes a physical therapist for these people. In any event, Andre Rand was a suspect in several homicides and several missing children. And the missing kids that he allegedly abducted were all um, mentally incapacitated. incapacitated. Uh, he actually lived at some point on the, on the grounds of Willowbrook. It was a 300 acre facility and he actually had like tents uh, built there for himself and some other homeless people. Uh, and again, he was implicated on several uh, missing children, but they could never pin it on him. He finally gets arrested for the kidnapping of one of these little girls, and he's in jail at the time. This is going back again to the mid-1990s when I pick up the case. I, apparently, I eventually run into somebody I know. Uh, I tell them where I'm working. And she actually asked me if I knew a girl, if I was involved at all with this Holly Ann Hughes child. And I had never even heard of it at the time. Holly Ann Hughes was a little seven-year-old girl who back in 1981 goes missing. And she told me Holly Ann Hughes lived in Staten Island and um, it was a big missing person case. And she, this person I'm talking to, actually knew Holly Ann Hughes' mother. And uh, she said, if I ever get a chance, if I could look into the case. So I did. I grabbed the case folder uh, or case folders. Uh, it was, a, again, it was another widely publicized case. And I seen that Andre Rand was the number one suspect along with a bunch of other cases he was involved with. At the time he was in jail, but he was due to be released soon. I went, I interviewed some of the people that had been interviewed in the past. Nobody would fess up that they actually saw Holly Ann Hughes with this guy, Andre Rand. People were afraid of him. Even though he was inside, people were still afraid of him when he would come out. Um, a lot of people thought he was involved with satanic rituals, involved with uh, the same cult that Berkowitz was involved with because when they did grab him originally, he had satanic uh, paraphernalia books and, and paintings, and they thought he was involved with that same kind of stuff. In any event, I was able to find one of the witnesses that said he saw Andre ran with the girl, but never saw them actually together. Uh, well, I grabbed this guy, brought him into the command, 
And he was actually afraid to be known as a rat. And he didn't want to rat on anybody. Even, even though Andre Rand was this really bad guy, uh, pedophile, uh, child abductor, he didn't want to be known as somebody that gave anybody up. But eventually he did. And once this guy gave up Andre Rand as being in the same car as Holly and Hughes, uh, we were able to rearrest. Well, we had some more investigation to do, but that was the nail that put Andre Rand in. That was the nail that closed his coffin, basically. And we were able to charge him with the abduction of Holly Ann Hughes. We couldn't charge him with the murder because they never found her body, but we were able to charge him with the murder of Holly Ann Hughes. So that was another case that um, we did in that, in that missing person squad. Going back to when I was in the DEA, guys asked me all the time, what did I think about uh, working as an undercover? After we did our Big Alphabet City case, I worked a bunch of undercover cases. And I know guys always ask me, how is it when you're an undercover? What do you feel? What do you think? Do you get scared? Yeah, the answer is you do get scared. I've had, I'll tell you a quick uh tell you two quick stories of, of just working on the cover case. I was doing this case up in Washington Heights. I had this Dominican drug dealer in the car with me, a heroin guy. I had never met him before. I had just been introduced to him. The guy that introduced me to him got out of the car. That guy I, I had drug, done drug deals with before, but this particular guy I had never met before. And we were up in Washington Heights, which at the, back in the 90s, uh, early 90s, late 80s, was a really congested area. You couldn't park your car. You couldn't even barely drive up there. And the guy makes me circle a block a few times, and he tells me to pull over. And when I pull over, there are guys shooting dice literally right next to me. I'm pulled over in a fire hydrant spot. And the guys are shooting dice right next to me. This guy tells me, um, we're going to do this drug deal. You better not be a cop. If I find out you're a cop, I'm going to kill you which was fine because people said, you know, I expect that, I expect to hear that. But what I didn't expect was he told me, turned my head, when I turned my head, the guy had an Uzi machine gun pointed in my, right in my ear. These guys playing dice, they were all part of this organization and he was gonna kill me. Uh, thankfully and thank God, I was able to convince this guy I wasn't a cop. We did the deal and we went our own, we went our own ways and we eventually locked up 17, 17 or 18 drug deals involved with this case. Another time I was buying, uh, again, buying heroin, and when I gave the guy the money, when he's counting the money, he's, the money is stained somehow with some kind of ink. Uh, not that we, st like, so when you make an arrest, NYPD stamps the money, DEA doesn't, but NYPD actually stamps the money as a form of putting it out of service and, and to use it as a, for evidence. Well, when this guy's counting the money, there's red ink all over the money. Uh, and I just took the money from the DEA office and it wasn't stamped, but apparently ink got on this money. And he took this money, he took this as thinking that it was buy money and that we'd be able to identify the money with this red ink on the money, but it wasn't. And we get into an argument. Uh, the guy behind me was a known shooter who had already shot at a cop. And basically I had to lie and argue with this guy and fight my way out of it that that was just a coincidence, which it was actually. And I was able to get out of that. So that's just a couple of incidents that, as a, that happened as on the cover cop. Um, and Being a cop is stressful, isn't it? Being a cop is uh, could be stressful, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, it's not easy. You know, you go home, you think about some of the things you've seen. Uh, you know, going back to Alphabet City, people don't realize that, like I said earlier, all the all the a good percentage of the crime relates back to the heroin. I remember going to an apartment once. The the there was a little bit. The mother was holding a baby. The baby had been dead probably several hours at the time. Empty glassine envelopes of heroin in the apartment. I tried to give the kid mouth to mouth, but I didn't try. I gave the kid mouth to mouth, but of course I didn't resuscitate him. The kid had been dead already uh, for some time. Uh, and again, in the apartment, the woman was obviously a drug user. Who knows what kind of 
what the situation was when she fed this kid last, how how she took care of this kid. All this stuff is interrelated with the heavy drug trafficking that was got down in Alphabet City. And you do actually, you know, people wonder if you bring that stuff home. Of course you bring that stuff home. You never forget that. Do you like more peaceful now that you've retired? Now that I'm retired, life's more peaceful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What have you learned about humans after all your years of being a, being a cop on the streets? You know, the truth of the matter is humans in general, I believe, are good people, are good, good in nature. But like anything else, uh, people, people want to better themselves. And sometimes it means selling drugs. Sometimes it means pushing the person next to you under the bus. And, uh, you know, people are out, a lot of people are out for themselves. Not everybody, but a good portion of people are out for themselves. And they'll do whatever it takes to get ahead. All right, Mike. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks. Thank you for having me. I wish you the best of luck with whatever you do from here on out. Thank you, man.